Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming. My name is Lukas Büringer, and I'm a researcher and engineer at NYU Secure Systems Lab, um, where I work on supply chain security projects. Uh, one of those projects is TUF, short for the Update Framework. And I should have given this talk today with my dear colleague Yussi uh, from VMware, but he had to cancel his trip to Valencia at the last moment. So I will try to cover for him. Um, the title of this talk could be uh, read in several ways, um, updates from the update framework. So one way to look at it is uh, that TUF is a framework to deliver secure content or to securely deliver content, can securely deliver content and uh, allow secure updates. Um, so we're gonna look a little bit at content delivery, uh, why it's important, why it's important to protect it, and how TUF can help you with that. And the other way of understanding the title, and this was the original intention, is that uh, TUF is a CNCF graduated uh, project, and I'll just give you updates of what happened in the or under the umbrella of the TUF project in the past year. Um, all right, but let's start start at the beginning. So, software updates, software distribution is a very crucial part of the software supply chain. At the edge of it, it is um, where things get multiplied. Or, um, so, whatever comes out of your software supply chain eventually it lands on many, many devices. Um, and those devices could be computers, it could be um, uh, container clusters, it can be phones, IoT devices, your light bulb, whatever. Um, so that's why it's also very attractive uh, for attackers to attack somewhere in the supply chain or at the content distribution infrastructure because a single compromise can, uh, yeah, can have huge impacts, affects thousands, millions of devices. Um, so I guess we all agree that we somehow have to protect the content and the content delivery infrastructure, and we have to do that at scale because the software supply chain is rarely um, write code, build it, distribute it, but it's really a supply chain of supply chains. So you pull in all these dependencies and um, so you can't just focus on your package that you maintain, but you also have to think of the entire dependency graph. Because again, uh, one, single supply, uh, one single compromise somewhere deep down in the dependency graph uh, has severe consequences. It affects all the packages downstream and yeah, who knows who, who works on this package? I mean, do you know it for all your dependencies as a maintainer? Um, maybe this is a solo maintainer without two-factor authentication enabled. Uh, maybe he's or she's uh, frustrated working for free um, and everybody relies on that package. So, and not even the maintainer of packages know, know where all their dependencies come from. So we really can't expect the end user to have a good picture of this entire dependency graph. Um, so the solution is uh, signing everything. Um, we are already doing that. We're sign signing a lot of things and uh, it is a good solution to protect the integrity and authenticity of artifacts. Uh, but it has its own problems. Um, signing alone won't be enough, so uh, you also need to know who you trust to provide a signature. And um, you need to do this as, at scale, as I said um, before in this graph. And um, even if you figure that problem out, how to, um, you, you need to know how to deal with a compromise because signature keys get lost, uh, they get stolen, and that is fatal. And uh, revocation is its own, has its own set of problems, and when you deal with a re revoke key and you have a new one, then you need to start with the trust decisions, decisions again. And then there are additional properties that you care about, which are freshness and consistency of um, um, your 
your repository artifacts. Um, so the good news is that the tough framework provides um, ideas and mechanisms to deal with these issues. Um, it has built-in protection for um, freshness, consi consistency, and integrity. Um, it allows you to delegate trust at any desired scale, and it has built-in compromise resilience. Uh, that means both it reduces the impact of a compromise, and it allows you to recover from a compromise in band. Um, let's take a closer look. Um, Tuff uses cryptographic signatures for this. Um, by signing the content itself, it protects its integrity, and by signing the entire repository, it protects the consistency. And it has a multi-tiered um, signature expiration scheme uh, to make sure that the content you download or update is fresh. So that is really the easy part of, uh, of Tough. You probably wouldn't need your own framework for this. Um, but here it gets more complicated, but also more interesting, so bear with me. Um, this graph you see in the middle defines the roles that are, or is like shows the roles that are defined by the Tough framework. Um, and the delegations, the trust delegations. And there are several different trust delegation mechanisms um, prescribed by Tuff. So first, on the top part of this graph, you see the uh, root delegation. This is where we separate responsibilities for a repository by roles. So there's a dedicated role for the freshness of the repository. There's a dedicated role for its consistency and a, de a dedicated role for the integrity of everything. Um, and it all goes back to the root of trust, this root role on top. And uh, we'll see on the next slide why this delegation is very helpful. And the second delegation mechanism um, separates responsibilities by content. So this is the lower bottom of the graph with the arrows. The integrity role in TUF can itself delegate to more integrity roles. Um, and by that you can kind of namespace uh, your, the trust in your repository. You say, um, I only want, want this role to um, provide signatures for, let's say in the case of, of PyPI and Python packages, I want this role to provide signatures for um, the Django project, uh, this web framework, and I want a different role to provide signatures for the cryptography project. So I don't want like each signature trusted, be trusted for everything. And then there is a third uh, mechanism for delegation uh, that works within a role. Uh, it means that you can share responsibility. So even for a specific role, like the root role, for instance, you can say, I don't want to put the trust in one key, but uh, I want a signature threshold. Um, So that was all about the trust delegation. That also helps us to re reduce the impact of a compromise because it allows us to balance out availability, um, risk, and responsibility. So by separating um, things into different roles, like a role for, for the freshness of the repository, one for the consistency, and a completely separate role for, for root of trust, I can make so that roles that have high responsibilities, can, um, uh, I can minimize the risk of a, of a key compromise um, and make them, by, by making them offline roles. So for instance, the, the root role um, is only responsible for delegating this trust to the other roles. And um, that means I don't need it so often and I can, I can sign it with offline keys. Um, roles for freshness and consistency, on, on the other hand, are in a, in a repository that gets updated very often, um, are high availability keys, so I will likely use online keys for this, and, um, but I, I don't give them any more responsibility than they have. I don't use them to get delegate trust to other roles, for instance. 
And so, yeah, maybe I should have said this earlier, delegating trust to a role basically means listing the keys for that role. Like uh, the root role has the public keys of all the other roles um, and the keys that the other roles use to sign. So this allows us to use the delegating, the, the, the delegating role or delegator to uh, just change the keys and thereby rotate keys for a delegated to role or delegatee. Uh, I know this is a lot and uh, I'm happy to talk more about it after the talk if someone has questions about this. Uh, it took me quite a while to understand it and yeah, I'm still trying to make it easier for others to understand. Mm. So we've seen how tough works in theory. Uh, let's take a look at what tough actually is. Mm. At its core, it's a specification. Um, then there is a process for updating that specification, the tap process, and then there is a reference implementation. And apart from that, there is a broader tough ecosystem. So the specification defines all those roles that we've seen in the graph. Um, what responsibilities they have, and above all, the metadata format uh, that is used to represent the role. And it also explains how to maintain, mani manipulate those metadata files for the roles in a repository to some extent, and in great detail, ex it explains how to consume that metadata on a client. Um, given that the specification is uh, very dependable, so uh, a lot of organizations or companies use tough. Uh, we can just go, go ahead and change it. Um, but also a living document because new use cases arise. We have this um, tough augmentation proposal process that we, we use to discuss new features and slowly adapt them in the specification in a responsible manner. And then the last thing at the core of the project is the reference implementation. It's a Python implementation that offers a client updater and a metadata API. A client updater can just be sticked into, uh, ju just be stuck into, into any software updater um, and basically works off the shelf. Uh, the, metadata, the metadata API is more flexible for repository side activities. I'll talk about that later, what that means. Um, the reference implementation is very symbiotic with the specification. Um, it's almost a little bit like secondary literature, so we designed it with readability in mind and also spec recognizability, so that when you look at the code, you like, uh, know, okay, this, this uh, comes from the spec. Uh, but it's also production code quality, so um, Datadog actually uses our reference implementation. And I personally am very happy that we recently uh, released 1.0 of the reference implementation, which followed a huge refactor where we um, removed a lot of legacy problems and made, made the code overall more modern and, and more easy to maintain. So that's the core of the project. And then there is more of the project. Um, there are several libraries uh, in different languages that implement Tough. There are several organizations and companies that use Tough. Um, Datadoc uses it. Uh, AWS Bottle Rocket uses it. Um, Google's Fuchsia OS uses it. Sigstore uses it. I'm going to talk about that later. Then there is um, a variant of Tough called Obtain, which is um, um, it uses like it's specification compliant, but adds extra things to work with the um, requirements of the automotive industry. And then there are a bunch of projects which are not really tough anymore. They're not specification compliant, but they, um, they were inspired by a lot of concepts of tough. tough. A sip of water. Mm. So let's dig even a little bit deeper what tough in practice means. I've already talked a lot about client and updater and also the repository side. So this is a notion that's really important for tough. Um, and yeah, so far we've, we've um, learned that tough is mostly a collection of metadata files, metadata files that lists keys, list keys, delegation relations, uh, content 
and signatures of it. Um, so in reality, this means that we, we need a repository that somehow um, maintains this metadata and the client, the client that knows what to do with it in order to, um, to guarantee all those security pro properties that we, we discussed earlier. And one problem in practice or one yeah, one problem in practice is that the repository, um, the, the way you, you create the layout, uh, the, the metadata there varies a lot from project to project. So um, you can't just use the tough, the tough code and stick it in and then it works. You have to really think of which roles exactly you mean, uh, you, you, you want to use. Um, but the good thing is that the client is relatively easy to use. Um, and I will show two use cases uh, where TUF is used or almost used. So PyPI is um, the, the Python packaging index. I don't know if everyone's familiar with it. That's where you get usually get your code when you do pip install. Um, and we've been trying to integrate TUF with PyPI for a while now. Uh, there are two different approaches or more two different stages of securing PyPI with TUF. Uh, the first one, um, hello. The first one only signs content in the repository um, that gives you the freshness and consistency and, of course, integrity properties that come with TUF. It also allows you to, um, like, gives you a mechanism to rotate keys with a safe root, um, root of trust um, in band. But it doesn't give you the fine-grained um, namespaces for different pro projects. Um, and it also um, doesn't allow you to have offline keys for, uh, for, the, for the content signatures because content gets uploaded loaded every se second. So these keys need to be online to sign it as soon as they're uploaded. Um, the second approach, these two approaches, like the first one I just talked of is uh, defined in PEP 458. Uh, which, um, yeah, we've been working on that hard in the last year and made some good progress. The second one, which bases on PEP 458, is called PEP 480. And this, um, this brings you these extra guarantees with namespaces for different pro projects um, and with offline signing keys for, for the, the artifacts in the repository, like the packages, uh, by um, making developers sign... Um, sign the code and the repository delegating trust to the developers. Um, this has a bunch of usability problems, how developers manage the keys, how the trust negotiation between the repository and the developers um, gets established in the beginning. So we're still trying to figure this out. And community repository, uh, that means repositories where code, uh, where packages get uploaded by random people are really a hard use case. Um, there are easier use cases um, like Sixdoor. Uh, they also use TUF um, to protect the root of trust of their uh, certificate authority and of their uh, transparency log called Recor. Um, so in their case, they don't use the TUF um, targets role, which is for protecting the, the integrity of the content to protect any, any actual software, but they use it to protect their keys, um, which gives them um, the, the guarantees that come with the root signature thresholds. It allows them to easily um, rotate keys with root if they get compromised and also has these freshness, freshness guarantees so that the attackers can replay uh, stale metadata or stale, stale packages. Um, yeah, those are two projects that, uh, the PyPI project is something that I've been working on a lot. Sixdoor is uh, something that the Sixdoor people have been working on a lot. They are featured with a booth here at the conference. Um, and both is still, I mean, Sixdoor is not so much work in progress. It's actually used in production, but there is still uh, more, more to come. Like they're trying to expand that lower part of the delegation tree with TUF. Um, and that, 
there we're almost at the end of the talk. Um, I wanted to, like there are many things happening in the near future. Two of them I wanted to point, point out um, are the repository playground. This is something that you see who couldn't come today is spearheading. Um, it's basically the attempt to, to create a new prototypical uh, community content repository uh, with real workflows and best practices um, that can then be easily adopted by, by real life repositories like PyPI or NPM because the problem of repositories like PyPI or NPM is that they, uh, they are relied upon by many, many, many people. So they are not so happy with experimenting with things and we can really do pathfinding life in the repository. So we try to uh, make a prototype um, that can then be adapted maybe by, by several, um, several content repositories. And that prototype should mostly be based on TUF because TUF really solves a lot of these problems already, but not exclusively. And another project which is related to Sigstore is um, the attempt to use ephemeral keys uh, that are connected to o OIDC identities, which are identities from email addresses, to use those for developer signing of, of the uh, tough targets metadata. Uh, because at the moment, uh, the targets role delegates um, normal uh, local key pairs and uh, yeah, there are a couple of UX uh, pain points with that, um, how developers can, can man manage their key material. And with the six store approach, we could maybe leverage the, the, um, the usage of these keys that are only, that only live for a very short time and are connected to the email addresses and um, authenticity providers that already exist and everyone uses when they log in via Google or via Facebook or via GitHub or whatever. Um, yeah, uh, that's it from my side for today. Um, the, there are many ways to get engaged with the tough community. There are many ways to reach out to us if you have questions, if you think that some of these ideas are good for your project. Um, we're happy to, to help brainstorm how it can really be used. Um, as I said, it is being used in many places. It looks very different in each place, at least the repository side. Um, so it's a bit of a barrier to get started with it, uh, but it's, it's definitely worth it. And I have a lot of references on the next two slides. I will make these available online um, for further reading. Thanks. Yeah, and I think we have another 10 minutes or so for questions, so I'm happy to take any. There's a microphone if someone wants to. Can I give you the microphone? I think it's recorded and it might be nice to. Do you think, or do you have any opinions for, against cosine and notary v2? What was the second thing, Co cosine and? Notary v2. Oh, um, I, I think they do different things, but I'm, I'm less familiar with notary, notary v2. I don't know it. If both of them basically use key as part of Not anymore. So no, um, Tough was used in Notary V1, ah, okay. but it's currently under redesign, and I don't know what they came up with at the moment. Marina knows better about that, but um, yeah, so I, I can't really give a recommendation. But what Cosine does looks really cool. The, the problem with Cosine and, and Sigster in general is that it doesn't have this. Um, fine-grained trust delegation I was talking about. So you can name, namespace, um, namespace who you trust for providing what. Like you can tie everything back to a certificate authority, but um, you've got to, yeah, 
you have a signature for a container, you see that it, in, it is in some transparency log, it ties back to a root of trust, but you don't really know if, if that signature was allowed to, like you have to, to do that separately. You have to somehow check the email address and see if it looks like the person uh, attached to the email address seems like someone who should provide a signature for that container. Um, but yeah, so I think, I mean, it's a, su a super cool tool and the ephemeral keys uh, solve a lot of the UX problems with signing, um, but I think it needs more, especially about this trust namespaces. Anyone else have questions? Can you speak more about um, like a how the trust namespaces work in like a practical example, like I don't know in um, Py in the Python mm -hmm. repository, is it like that the package maintainer signs and then as well the repository signs, and so you kind of have like multiple layers of trust there. Or? Yeah. I th so in the current in the current draft of PEP, of, of PEP 480, um, it would be sort of a trust on first use that when you register um, with PyPI that you you upload public keys that will then like be audited uh, by the PyPI maintainers and at some point get into the delegating metadata that like delegates the trust to the developer. Uh, but it's a bit hand wavy currently in the PEP and this really needs to be figured out in a better way. I think that's the reason why it has not yet uh, been implemented because it's not so easy. Um, yeah. All right. Anyone else? Any questions? Cool. I guess we can take this again. Yeah. Thanks, everyone, for coming.